Get ready for an unprecedented clash between the legendary Hell's Angels and the mighty cartels. Behind prison walls, a world of alliances, rivalries, and power struggles unfolds. Picture the Sinaloa Cartel, the Sijiang, and Los Zetas as three dark forces fighting for dominance. These cartels, infamous for drug trafficking and violence, shape the criminal landscape with their ruthlessness. But then there's the Hell's Angels, a motorcycle club known for its toughness and violence. They might seem like regular bikers, but their history reveals a darker side. Their collaboration with El Chapo's Sinaloa cartel is just a glimpse into their potential for partnership with other cartels. You didn't know this? We'll reveal some shocking details later. Now picture this. When members from cartels and Hell's Angels end up in the same prison, you can guess what happens. It's not hard to see why they quickly become friends or enemies. Outside of prison, cartels and Hell's Angels might not interact much. But inside prison, things change. The rules are different. And it's a whole new game. Get ready to uncover the story of how these tough groups navigate life behind bars, where friendships form fast and conflicts flare up just as quickly. You might think everyone there will understand and agree with your club's ideas. But guess what? Some people in prison might have different thoughts. The same thing happens to drug lords and cartel members. They're used to being in charge and using violence when things don't go their way. But when they meet people from other groups in prison, things can get tricky. Their differences allow them to compete to see who is the toughest. But sometimes they have to work together to stay safe. Before we dig into all the interesting details about how the Hell's Angels and cartel members get along in jail, let's learn where these groups come from and what they believe. The Hell's Angels like to do things their own way. They ride special motorcycles and have members all over the world. They started a long time ago when a bunch of smaller groups joined together. So get ready to learn about tough bikers and cartel members, their history, and what happens when they're together stuck in prison. This is a story you do not want to miss. It's important to understand the history and origins of the Hells Angels and the Mexican cartels. And boy, does this story get mysterious already. It's quite unclear when the Hells Angels were founded. Some say that the club was founded back in 1948 in Fontana, California, by a World War II veteran named Otto Friedley. He started the club after breaking from the pissed-off bastards motorcycle club over a feud with a rival gang. In 1948, they decided to join forces and become one. The Hells Angels were born. But another guy, named Dick White, might also have a big role in starting the Hells Angels. Some stories say he founded the group in November 1951, but there is no clear proof. But according to the club's official website, a man named Arvid Olson suggested the name Hell's Angels. However, the club made its official chapter in Fortana, California in 1950. For about 10 years, the Hell's Angels moved from city to city, making new chapters wherever they went. They wanted the club to spread far and wide. But let's talk about what happened in 1957. In that year, another chapter of the Hells Angels was started in Oakland by a man named Ralph Sonny Baja. As more new chapters were being created, it became clear that not everyone who joined knew about the history of the club. Was this a threat to the club's core values? Then, in 1961, something special happened. The Hells Angels reached a new place, Auckland, New Zealand. This was a big step because it was the first chapter they established outside of California. Now the Hells Angels have over 6,000 members spread across approximately 467 chapters in 59 different countries. But let's quickly move on, because this is a story that you will never forget. As the club was spreading to new cities, they were careful about who could join. Not just anyone could become a member. There was a process to go through. So, how could someone become a full member of the Hells Angels? Well, the first step was to start as a prospect. This means you weren't a full member yet, but you were on your way to becoming one. It all starts with being a prospect. To be a prospect, you need a Harley Davidson with over 750 cc, a valid driver's license, and certain good qualities that match the club's values. Having a motorcycle is really important for this club. They love riding Harley-Davidson bikes, though some groups accept other kinds, too. 
But there are some strict rules. They don't allow people who have done bad things to children. And they also say no to people who wanted to be police officers or prison officers before. This is because they want to make sure no undercover police officers get into the club. They also don't let members use drugs through needles. If someone breaks these rules, they might get kicked out. If you're a prospect, you'll go through different stages before becoming a full member. First, there's the hang around stage. During this time, you'll get to go to some events and meet the club's current members. After that, you might become an associate. This part takes the longest, even up to two years. And finally, if all goes well, you'll get to the last step of becoming a full member. It's a process, but it helps the club make sure everyone fits in and follows the rules. It's pretty clear they are picky to who will and who won't join the Hells Angels. But wait until you hear how the cartels choose their members. But first let's talk about the last step to becoming a full member of the Hells Angels. The person who was an associate before is now called a prospect again. But things are a bit different this time. They can take part in some activities, but they don't have the right to vote. To become a full member, they need the agreement of all the other full patch members. These are the people who already have the highest membership status. Before the vote, the prospect has to visit different chapters of the club and introduce themselves to all the full patch members they meet. This is so the members can decide if the prospect is a good fit for the club. If all goes well and everyone agrees, the prospect becomes a full member. At this point, they get a special set of patches that show their full members. These patches are a big deal because they show that someone is a full member. But even though you have the patches, they still belong to the club. If someone leaves the club, they have to give the patches back. Full members have some responsibilities too. They have to pay dues and go to meetings, which are often called church. These meetings happen in clubhouses or sometimes at a member's house, yet, like a story with hidden chapters, a different reality unfolds. While the Hells Angels claims innocence as a community of motorcycle enthusiasts, a shadow stretches across their path. Some members, driven by darker impulses, have been drawn into the murkier realms of crime. Stories of drug trafficking and even the chilling touch of murder have marred the club's legacy. The legal gaze is unrelenting. The United States Department of Justice, joined by intelligence agencies across the globe, casts a weighty judgment. They see an organized crime syndicate, not just a club. The narrative of the Hells Angels has shifted from simple beginnings to a more complex tale. As time winds its way through the years, transformations take shape. The Hells Angels, which might have started with innocence at its core, has evolved in ways that command attention. The timeline from 1994 to 2002 shines a spotlight on these evolutions, painting a vivid portrait of a club that treads a path both intriguing and controversial as it navigates the blurred line between camaraderie and the pull of forbidden exploits. It didn't take long before some notorious Hells Angels members were sentenced to jail. From drug dealing to kidnapping to murder. Some were sentenced to life in prison, while others faced many, many years behind bars. And this is the place where the Hells Angels meet the cartel members. Their fierce loyalty shapes how they engage with others, from fellow inmates to drug cartels and their powerful leaders. The drug cartels are organized crime machines masterminded by the infamous drug lords. These kingpins don't just run drugs. They orchestrate every move in the dangerous game, controlling production, distribution, and prices in different corners of the world. Crafting a criminal empire is their art. They assemble armies, perfectly structured and dripping with funds, all aimed at a singular goal, the massive trafficking of drugs. But don't be surprised if these lords of the underworld also dabble in a medley of other unlawful ventures. Their secret weapon? Violence. It's their currency of dominance, the driving force behind their rule. Remember this critical piece as we dive deeper into the story. The role of violence is like an inkling of insight into the interactions we're about to uncover. Interactions between these fierce cartels and the relentless Hell's Angels within prison walls. It's a story that hinges on power, loyalty, and the unrelenting pull of the criminal underworld. Imagine violence as a double-edged sword, 
It slashes through rival cartels, carving out new territories and carving a path for dominance. At the top of this intricate hierarchy stands the enigmatic drug lord, a puppet master pulling strings from the shadows. They're the architects of alliances, the maestros of strategy, and the puppeteers of hits and operations. Their realm encompasses every facet of the cartel's existence, from grand strategies to daily operations. Right by their side stands the lieutenant, the right-hand enforcer of this empire. These are no ordinary seconds in command. They're tasked with ruling over their own slices of the cartel, steering the destiny of smaller factions in different lands. As guardians of their territory, they oversee hitmen and falcons, eyes sharp and authority unchallenged. Unlike mere pawns, they have the power to order hits. No permission needed from the top. This isn't a tale of black and white. It's a saga of intrigue and hierarchy. In this criminal symphony, power and control flow like a river of blood, revealing a world where violence isn't just a tool, but the very pulse of an empire's heartbeat. Before we reveal the unique relationship between the Hells Angel and the Mexican cartels in jail, it's important to dive into the heart of the cartel's hierarchy first, where a world of dark deeds unfolds. Imagine hitmen as the relentless soldiers, fierce and unyielding, carrying out the cartel's ruthless commands. They are more than mere enforcers. They're the doers of the dirty work. Kidnappings, extortion, thefts, they're the hands that execute these chilling tasks. Yet, their role goes beyond that. They stand as the fortress against rival cartels and the watchful eyes of the law, guarding their realm with deadly determination. But there's another tier in this shadowy pyramid, the Falcons. Envision them as the silent sentinels, perched on the edges of the underworld. Their role is clear, to be the eyes and ears on the streets, capturing every whispered secret and every unspoken intention. They're the intelligence gatherers, the ones who navigate the murky alleys and bustling corners, soaking in every detail to report back to their cartel overlords. Yet, amidst this intricate structure, there's an undercurrent of ambiguity. As we descend deeper into the abyss of the cartel's world, the Falcons hold a unique place. They are like phantoms, existing but not officially recognized as members of the cartel. This enigma adds a layer of complexity to the hierarchy, a reminder that not everything is as it seems. Next in line in the hierarchy are the ones in the production arm of the cartel. Those daredevils are the ones who smuggle drugs across the country. These notorious men are also part of the inner circle of the cartel because they are responsible for a big part of the cash flow inside the cartel. These guys are often the face of a cartel, as they are also very likely to get arrested and set to prison. Other members of a cartel aren't as visible as we would assume. Think about accountants or other people who will help launder money earned from the drugs trafficking and dealing. Although drug cartels exist all over the world, the most famous and most notorious drug cartels can be found in Mexico. They are responsible for smuggling thousands of tons of illegal drugs into the United States. But in the last decades, the cartels in and around Mexico have increased. All of them, being notorious and violent, brings a new dynamic to the picture. Rival gangs frequently clash with each other, which ends up in war or killing each other. Unfortunately, a lot of innocent citizens are victims of this violence. It's just a matter of wrong place, wrong time. These aren't just random facts. A report by the Congressional Research Service, CRS, even shows that the country faced between 125,000 to 150,000 homicides organized by different drug cartels in the country between 2006 and 2018. Notorious members are Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo, leader of the Guadalajara cartel, Osil Cardenas Guillen, who led the Los Zetas cartel, and Griselda Blanco, who is also internationally known as the godmother of cocaine. I mean, do we need to say more? These are the names that send shivers down the spines of even the Hell's Angels, the cartels that inspire both fear and a peculiar sense of collaboration behind bars and beyond. As the dark tapestry unfolds, three names rise to the top, crowned as the worst of the worst. These aren't just cartels. They're legendary forces that defy the boundaries of what's imaginable. Picture the Sinaloa cartel, 
an entity that seems to dance on the edge of authority, moving with an agility that defies capture. Then there's the CJ Eng cartel, an enigma shrouded in a cloak of ruthless tactics, their aura one of orchestrated chaos. And let's not forget the Los Zetas cartel, a name that echoes with tales of brutality and a disregard for humanity. These cartels are more than criminal enterprises, they're forces of nature, bending the rules of engagement and redefining the boundaries of power. Their presence reverberates through the criminal world, and even the Hell's Angels, a group known for their own formidable reputation, tread cautiously in their shadows. These are the names that ink history with blood, leaving an indelible mark on the landscape of organized crime. But one cartel that rules them all is the Sinaloa Cartel. Does this name ring a bell? You will soon discover why. They are known as one of the strongest cartels to have ever existed in Mexico. They are known as the Federation or the Blood Alliance, a shocking, notoriously crime group that stands as a symbol of defiance, repeatedly outmaneuvering the government's attempts to eradicate cartels in Mexico. And this for over many years. Originated in the early 1980, they found their roots from the other well-known Guadalajara cartel. At that time, the government had their eyes on the cartel, making it more and more difficult for them to cooperate and exist. It caused the cartel to break down into smaller groups, with one of them as the Sinaloa cartel. No one other than the infamous drug lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman took leadership of the Sinaloa cartel, with their act of violence and notoriety. They quickly rise to the top of the cartels in Mexico. According to various resources, one of their businesses is the distribution of cannabis, heroin, and cocaine. But we also know that they launder money and various forms of racketeering. They proved that they were the most violent and ruthless cartel out there. In 2015, they broke El Chapo out of prison through an underground tunnel that members from the cartel dug. El Chapo's incarceration did not do much to end the Sinaloa cartel as his sons took over from where he left off and are still operating to date. They have to deal with rival cartels like the Los Zetas cartel. Back in 1997, the Los Zetas cartel emerged from the shadows, originally serving as the muscle for the Gulf cartel under the command of Osiel Cardenas Guilen. At a time when the leadership of the Gulf cartel was shaky, Cardenas took the reins and assembled a squad of ex-military personnel, forming a fearsome bodyguard and hitmen squad. This loyal group stood by Cardenas until his arrest and extradition, but the dynamic shifted, and the Los Zetas soon outgrew their role. They broke away from the Gulf Cartel, their strength doubling theirs. It was in February 2010 that they officially stamped their mark on Mexico's criminal landscape. From then on, a wave of ruthless violence crashed upon the Mexican people, orchestrated by the ex-military members who had been trained for war. These men wielded military-grade weapons with ease, making violence their reflexive response to any challenge. This cartel wasn't content with staying in the shadows. They spread their influence across the nation, even hosting military training camps for those eager to join their ranks. Their growth was nothing short of explosive. At one point, they held the title of Mexico's largest cartel, their reach extending across the nation's territory. The cartel's grip extended to trafficking routes, extortion schemes, and kidnappings, painting a bleak picture of their dominion. With origins tied to loyalty and the pursuit of power, the Los Zetas cartel swiftly transformed into an unstoppable force that shook the foundations of Mexico's criminal landscape. For a while, the cartel controlled trafficking routes, protection rackets, extortion, and kidnappings. They fought hard to defeat other groups and take control of their areas, aiming to make lots of money. But their quick success didn't last long. The Gulf Cartel teamed up with the Sinaloa Cartel and La Familia Michoacana to fight against Los Zetas. In response, Los Zetas asked for help from the Beltran Leva Cartel, the Juarez Cartel, and the Tijuana Cartel. As time went on, Los Zetas faced fights within their own group and also had problems with the Mexican government. This isn't surprising because they are used to fighting with other gangs. However, they probably met their equal in the Chalisco New Generation Cartel, also known as CJNG. This set the stage for a big clash between these two powerful groups. 
CJNG is one of Mexico's most brutal gangs, led by a man named El Mencho, who is among the world's most wanted drug lords. The gang started when a larger group, the Milenio Cartel, split into smaller parts due to their leaders getting caught or killed. El Mencho took charge of one of these smaller groups and turned it into the powerful and feared CJ Eng gang we know today. CJ Eng makes a lot of money by moving cocaine and methamphetamine, but they also do many illegal activities. Their reputation is built on using aggression and extreme violence to get what they want. When they first started, they were involved in terrible events, where they killed many people in different places like Veracruz, Jalisco, Guadalajara, and Sinaloa. The cartel has a strange habit of proudly admitting to the killings they commit. They even go as far as sharing disturbing videos of torture on social media, showing the world their cruel actions. Under El Mencho's control, the cartel expanded its operations to the United States and other nations. By 2020, it was considered the most dangerous criminal group in Mexico and the second most powerful cartel, right after the Sinaloa cartel. When it comes to interactions between cartels and the Hells Angels, there's an interesting dynamic. The Hells Angels can be a helpful choice for cartels needing assistance because they have chapters across the United States and in different countries. The connection between these cartels and the Hells Angels often leans towards forming alliances rather than engaging in conflicts. While the Hells Angels are primarily a motorcycle club, They've also branched out into drug trafficking, expanding the scope of their operations. This puts them on a similar wavelength with cartels, who are the key players in this illegal trade. Interestingly, beyond prison confines, Hells Angels members have been observed collaborating with cartels. A notable instance of this connection surfaced in 2019, during the much-anticipated trial of the notorious drug lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman. Testimonies from witnesses during that trial provided concrete evidence that the motorcycle club, often seen as outlaws, readily assists cartels whenever the opportunity arises. The key witness in this scenario was Hildebrando Alexander Alex Chifuentes Villa, a trusted lieutenant in the Sinaloa cartel under El Chapo's command. In his testimony, Alex recounted an episode where he met with Canadian Hells Angels members. The purpose of this meeting was to discuss orchestrating an attack on a Canadian real estate agent who had become entangled with El Chapo and the Sinaloa cartel. As Alex explained, the real estate agent, known as Stephen Tello or Catboy, had transitioned from his real estate role to becoming involved in drug trafficking on behalf of El Chapo. Alex's own journey had led him to earn El Chapo's confidence over years of service. This trust resulted in him being tasked with overseeing the distribution of drugs to Canada. His responsibilities included delivering drugs to Canadian wholesalers, collecting the proceeds, and funneling the funds back to the cartel for further drug acquisitions. Tilo played a significant role on the Canadian side of the illicit enterprise. He collaborated closely with Alex, devising ways to transport drugs into the United States using methods like trailers, helicopters, and boats. This partnership initially proved lucrative, amassing millions from these operations. Regrettably for Tello, his association with a seasoned criminal meant that trouble was brewing. El Chapo, recognizing that Tello might be engaging in dubious dealings with the funds entrusted to him, swiftly began suspecting his motives. It appeared that Tello might have been misappropriating the drugs for personal gain or even embezzling the funds that rightfully belonged to El Chapo. Consequently, the drug lord resolved to take decisive action to eliminate the threat that Tello posed. El Chapo attempted to persuade Tello to come to Mexico under the pretense of a visit, but with a hidden agenda of orchestrating his execution upon arrival. However, Tello declined the offer, prompting El Chapo to consider an alternative plan. Since Tello showed no willingness to journey to Mexico, El Chapo sought out a solution within Canada itself. He turned to the Canadian Hells Angels, enlisting their help to carry out the hit. Fortuitously for Talo, his fate took a different turn. He managed to evade the clutches of death by getting arrested, ultimately receiving a 15-year prison sentence. This outcome, though unfavorable, paled in comparison to the dire fate he would have faced at the hands of the Hell's Angels. Thus, Talo narrowly escaped the gravest danger, 
even though the arrangement with El Chapo didn't unfold as initially intended. The Hells Angels' readiness to collaborate with the drug lord could significantly shape their future interactions, both within prison walls and beyond. The likelihood of these two groups joining forces again remains high, given their shared involvement in violent activities. This shared line of business may either draw them closer together or drive a wedge between them. The dynamics of prison gangs are often hidden from public view, making it rare for the interactions between different gangs behind bars to make headlines. Still, there have been instances where glimpses of these interactions have surfaced, providing a limited understanding of what transpires among gangs in confinement. Consequently, much of our insight is derived from these occasional events, leading to speculative interpretations of their dynamics. Encounters among prison gangs can range from aggressive confrontations to more peaceful exchanges, contingent on the groups involved and the prevailing circumstances. These interactions can be broadly categorized into three main types, alliances formed between gangs, rivalries emerging within the realms of illicit enterprises managed by these groups, and the necessity for a gang to maintain supremacy or exert control within the prison environment. Let's delve into the realm of alliances. Even though prison gangs can originate from diverse backgrounds with varying agendas, instances have arisen where gangs sought assistance or offered support to other gangs. There are occasions when two distinct gangs join forces unexpectedly, driven by a range of motives. Typically, such unions occur either to collectively repel a rival gang's threat or to collaborate in pursuit of a shared objective. An illustrative example of such an alliance unfolded between the Gulf Cartel and another prison gang. The Gulf Cartel found itself in dire straits and opted to turn to this gang for aid. During a phase of the Gulf Cartel's supremacy in Mexico, a consignment of their marijuana was brazenly stolen in a location unfamiliar to them. Faced with the challenge of locating their stolen shipments, the cartel acknowledged its limitations and sought assistance from a prison gang named Partido Revolucionario Mexicano. This gang was established by Mexicans who were incarcerated in Texas. The gang possessed knowledge of local drug dealers residing within the county where the drug theft occurred, prompting their agreement to assist the cartels in investigating the incident. Gang members engaged with the suspected drug dealers by purchasing the stolen narcotics, but the exchange turned confrontational involving abduction and intimidation tactics to extract information about the theft and the hidden stash. Unfortunately, the intervention of law enforcement thwarted the gang's efforts, leading to the drugs remaining undiscovered. The fact that cartels would turn to prison gangs for assistance underscores that, despite their differences, they are willing to collaborate when mutual benefits are at stake. Inside prisons, the battle for control becomes a central driver for interactions between gangs. Dominant gangs wield authority, influencing the operations of other gangs, setting pricing for goods traded within prisons, and determining the pace at which each gang conducts their activities. Nonetheless, instances arise when these decisions fail to align with the interests of all parties, resulting in conflicts. The quest for power and supremacy in prison has led to numerous fatalities among inmates caught up in the struggle. A chilling instance of a prison clash escalating into a violent catastrophe unfolded recently in Ecuador. At the time of the incident, the prison was grappling with overcrowding, accommodating approximately 9,000 inmates. The persistent surge in the country's cartel presence directly correlates with the growing tally of cartel members incarcerated each year. A power struggle between rival gangs ignited a riot within the prison's confines, culminating in a tragic surge of fatalities. Inmates participating in the riot were armed with an assortment of weapons, including knives, machetes, glocks, and any sharp objects they could lay their hands on. The tragic incident concluded with a staggering loss of lives among the inmates. Government authorities reported a harrowing toll, with 116 inmates losing their lives and another 78 suffering injuries in the wake of the riot. The situation took an even darker turn as five decapitated bodies were discovered amidst the aftermath. 
The impact was heart-wrenching for the families of the deceased, who were confronted with the grim task of identifying their loved ones among the badly mutilated remains in the morgue. The struggle for dominance within prison walls remains an ongoing challenge, perpetuated by the existence of prison gangs. Regrettably, these conflicts cast a shadow over other prisoners who simply aim to serve their sentences and move forward. With an increasing number of Hell's Angels Club members facing prison sentences, their encounters with other gangs or cartels become almost inevitable. Their previous willingness to collaborate with Chapo suggests a potential openness to similar arrangements with different cartels, provided the incentives align. Yet, it's important to note that much of this understanding is rooted in speculation, as the inner workings of incarcerated criminals from diverse groups remain largely veiled from public view. What do you think? Make sure to subscribe to channel, give this video a like, and drop a comment. Thanks for watching.